Hi, I'm Augie Gonzalez with Data Core Software. I'm part of the technical marketing team out of Fort Lauderdale. And I've got a couple of colleagues I'll introduce in a second, but I wanted to first focus your attention on what our topic today, which is on high velocity transaction processing and real time analytics. And it's actually a, some novel work out of Data Core that will be very, very new for you as well as for us. It came out of some uh, activities we've done in the storage sector that's blossomed and mushroomed into a new branch and a new line of products for us. And we've just introduced that. This is our launch week. This is uh, our tour. This is the West Park Coast uh, part of our tour that we're executing today, fortunately. And I'm going to be the, uh, the closing act for Tech Field Day. So that, that's kind of neat. The name of the product we're going to uh, talk about is called Max Parallel for SQL Server. So that gives you a hint that's a little bit different than anything else you would have seen from us. It's very much focused on database optimization software. And a part of what came from our studies, our R&D activities in the past here, is we've been looking at some of the very high data rates that are generated by some of these immense databases. And we were wondering, as we looked at the, the storage side of the picture from our our traditional vantage point, we noticed that there was some unusual behavior occurring up at the host that were not generating the kind of activities that we expected. So this led us to do some further investigation, and it's part of that discovery that we're going to share with you today, and the byproducts of that R&D effort that resulted in this line of products. So the, um, the way we're going to break it up is I'll kick it off now with a little bit about the, the concepts behind what we're doing here, the customer experiences and outcomes that have occurred throughout the first wave of activity. And then I'll turn it over to Tim for a short demonstration of the software. And then we'll close it with uh, Robert Bassett, our VP of Software Engineering, to give you kind of a deeper dive of the science behind it all. And uh, you know, you'll see I'll probably anything that you shoot at me that looks difficult, guess where it's going, right there. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's the uh, setup for that. If that's, if that's good with you guys, we're eager to hear your impressions. We have had quite a few conversations with a number of uh, people who are very ex experts, high experts, subject matter experts in this, and we've had a really warm reception to it. So we're, we're kind of pumped up about it. The, uh, the essence of what Max Parallel for SQL Server does is it helps companies in, in plain English language is process orders quicker than they ever could before, be able to get an assessment of their position in terms of resources, assets, inventory, so that they can make some good informed decisions, data-driven decisions about how to act against threats and opportunities and also to analyze trends that may forecast uh, future behavior for them. So this is a, a very business-oriented effort. It, uh, unlike most of the things that you're used to seeing here, in this case, the software helps them without having to add any additional hardware, without having to recode their databases or re-architect the way that data is deposited on the host. This is a central theme, and this is one of the things that makes it very unique and very specially appealing. So the, the applications, if, if you look at the, the universe of things where databases are applied, we're very much concentrated on this subset, especially at the outset here on the OLTP side of the house. That is the online transaction processing as relates to things like ERP, whether that's a Microsoft Dynamics environment or a Sage environment, things that have to do with a lot of the e-commerce, the engines behind the e-commerce. SQL Server is often the back end, the workhorse behind those line of business applications. And that's why we're, our attention is so sharply pointed at that. The other area that we see here is in the ERP section is inventory management asset tracking and making conscious choices about the distribution of parts and assets. There's some other activities uh, as part of our, our venture into this application space. Uh, they have to do more with the analytics side of the house. 
things like threat assessment, fraud detection, things like uh, faults, fault detection in manufacturing and construction. And of course, you know, it wouldn't be complete without talking about IoT. And the reason I bring up IoT here is IoT has a lot of data ingestion requirements that are placed on these SQL Server databases. So it's important to make, be able to make them more responsive and more productive. So with that, uh, what I did want to show you is part of what the, the domain of special interest is not your run-of-the-mill database. It is those databases where it, it, they're very time critical, they're data intensive problems, and the customers, the consumers of these who are running the business are basically overwhelmed by the volume of information being thrown at them. So if that's, if that's absent, then this product won't be for them. And what I'll do is I'll characterize for you what the best fit is, and with that, understand also what, um, what would not be good use cases for it. The, the individuals that are most, I think, consumed by the urgency associated with these challenges are line of business owners. Those are usually on the front lines of what we're discussing here. They have the, the most urgent need to understand their, what's around them, have situational awareness about that. Clearly, the database administrators who are in charge of making this all look good for them and providing the responsive information the database warehouse designers and the data scientists that are all kind of piecing these things together and trying to structure information in a way that's palatable for them. And of course, the business intelligence or BI analyst. Now there are also, uh, we have uncovered as part of our initial coming out party, is that there's two other constituents that are especially keen on what's happening in this space. One are the ISVs, the independent software vendors who are building the vertical line of business applications on top of SQL Server. Because they are often measured by how well the back end behaves. And to the degree that the customer is feeling a sluggish behavior there and is unsatisfied with that, that dissatisfaction reflects on them. So uh, we see them as a key stakeholder here. So too are the cloud service providers. So cloud service providers are hosting many of these applications, both the back-end database as well as the customer-facing part of it. And so they are equally incented to address uh, response time issues, latency issues that are incurred, especially when there's a lot of volume involved here. What I want to paint here is a little bit now uh, an understanding that, that helps frame the discussion for this, the second half. This, this little diagram is a simple construct that SQL Server, for example, would be used to sort a parts table. So I'm doing inventory work. I'm trying to figure out, OK, I've got all this slew of parts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this to show how SQL operates on these things and where it runs into certain choke points. And it'll, hopefully it'll be a bit drive your curiosity a bit. So when SQL Server itself does a really good job of parallelizing work, and that should be, that's, that's one of the things. So in doing that, it can take something that, like a long running sort, that in this case may have been A through Z, and break it up into smaller jobs. And each of those jobs will say, okay, what we'll do is I'll dole out the A through G part of that sort as one stream, the H through M, the N through S and the T through Z, give them basically to the operating system, hand it over to them, say, look, uh, from your standpoint, these are fully independent, put them out there, you've got a multi-core server, work on them, so that hopefully, by dividing the job stream this way, we can shorten the time to complete the sort. Maybe in a fourth of the time, ideally, right? We, we took it, we had just done it, serially through here, it would have taken a much longer time. So this, uh, for those of you who are not SQL Server, this is basically just selecting that list and, and sorting them in descending order. Why do you say should and hopefully? What, under what conditions do I have a good chance of that helping and, and which conditions is it probably not going to help? Here's where it's not going to happen, okay? 
So this is, this is exactly where I'm going with that, James. So the, the operating system takes that and says, OK, I recognize that these modules, basically, I can put them on different cores. And that's what this represents. So this, is a, this diagram is a four, an eight-core system. Each of the tiles represents one core. And the top row is the computational work that been, they've been tasked with. So that's the sorting, the proper sorting once it's in memory. What's interesting about this is the moment you give it to the operating system, the operating system says, I know how to create these, these separate threads. However, and this is the big however, when it comes down to the I.O. processing associated with each of these independent requests, have nothing to do with each other, there's a single global queue that they're all put on. And this, every time I've uh, spoken to somebody who's in this business and they, they start looking at this, they start getting kind of that aha moment. What's occurring here is that despite SQL's best effort to paralyze the work, there's somebody that's defeating part of that parallelism by, by sequentially driving these I.O. streams down one, one leg. And when Robert talks about this in a few minutes, you'll see why that manifests itself. But the essence of it is that you look at these systems, you go, why are they, why are they running so slow? And how come as much work as I'm throwing at them that some few of the resources are being put to use? I've got all these cores. I would have expected much more activity. And I would have expected much more IOs coming out of this baby. And it just isn't happening. And, and very much, so, so one thought is, well, you know, if I've got idle cores, let's throw more work at it. It looks like I'm at 30% CPU utilization. I must have a lot of horsepower. Let's put some more work. Guess what happens when you do that? It exacerbates the problem. Because now you have more concurrent tasks that are contending for that same serial I.O. processing queue. So. Again, to restate, make sure I understand this because I'm not a DBA. The, when I'm looking at the overall system, see CPU utilization at 30%, and say, oh, the system is under text, I may be ignoring I.O., and I.O. is the actual problem, not the, is actually the right. bottleneck in the system. That's exactly right. It's not a, there, the, what's happening is A through G, what I'm trying to get across with A through G being a little <laughs> darker than the other ones, is A through G is currently active with an I.O. request. And this, the I, these operating system said, sure, I'll take that one. H through M is sitting there going, I'm ready to do some I.O. But the operating says, hold on, why don't you go to sleep for a little bit? In computer time, it's a little bit, OK? And I'll let you know when I'm ready to get to you. So Same thing with N through S. What it looks like you've got, or what the problem is, because I haven't really paid that much attention. I've had this problem in my own stuff with data analysis, is what's happening, if I understand it correctly, is that you look like you've paralleled stuff there, but all you've done is simply put a key, just one queue. It's just ultimately one queue, because the I.O. is essentially the bottleneck. Is that an exactly, accurate way of describing exactly. it? And, and it's not, so one thing, uh, because a lot of us that came out of storage might think, well, if I've got a lot of devices, I could stripe all that I.O. and all that. This is upstream of all that. OK, so this is very crucial to the understanding about the problem. OK, so I got two, two things are bothering me. OK. One is exactly where is that single queue at? at NTFS where we've got to figure out where it is in the file system. Let's, and we will can walk through that, that. In, okay? In so we'll do a little okay. uh, whiteboarding for you so you can see where the, the crux of the issue is. Okay. What's and, your second? And, and while I'm willing to give it to you as a oversimplification for the purposes, if you had to make a PowerPoint slide, you know, I have, you have to examine that data item before you know whether it starts with an A through G or an H plus M so the sort doesn't actually parallelize that way. That's but right. that's just an oversimplification. Right. It is an oversimplification. Okay. I, I have to get, if not, it takes me a little, yeah, a little longer to complete I'll, I'll the give thought. it okay. to you. So some work has done clearly to break this up so that you get to that point. Yeah. And that was part of that, that initial sequencing that occurred yeah. in the outset. But at the end of the day, the reason this one is red and this one's a little kind of brown and green is these guys are, one of this extra heated because that one's been waiting for all three in front of it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a while before it gets to it. 
So this is, this is when, I, when I've, I just came from Ignite, Microsoft Ignite. I probably spoke to over 90 people that were somehow involved with SQL Server. And the moment they saw that, it's like, that explains it. That explains why, despite how much provisioning I've thrown at this, how much hardware I put on it, how much SSDs and all this other stuff that I've done, I've done all the tweaking I could on the networking side of this stuff, it's just not pumping. It's not, as one of our guys says, not moving the mail. <laughs> it's just not, not getting there. And so there's a, a revelation here that, that's, that's very striking. So what, what can we do about that? Well, the, a very common reaction to this problem is, OK, if I can only drive so much I.O., not knowing what's going underneath the covers, just simply accepting the fact that this one server isn't, isn't accomplishing the job required, what they start to look at is the scale out. Oh, we'll scale out. Sounds so much fun. You know, it's so modern to be scaling out. Well, scale out has several complications that come with it. Part of it is that first you've now this, just to Howard's point, you start having to now segregate these different jobs outwardly across and spread them. So there's a data management issue associated with this. That gets a little hairy, okay? That's the simplest way to get it. So I could say, well, you know, I'll, what I'll use, I'll, I'll use smaller servers and I'll split this load this way, and then somehow I will re-aggregate that data when I reach my conclusion, and that'll be, you know, the output at the end of the day. Augie, okay, I don't know if anybody ever told you, but distributed systems are hard. They are. I agree. So having to fall back to this <clears throat> is very painful. It also, what it does is also gets expensive. It gets expensive from all the servers I gotta throw at it, all the SQL Server licenses I have to buy to do this. And by the way, SQL Server licenses are sold in a minimum of four cores. So even if you could just put two cores to work because you felt that was the optimum mix, you'd still be signing up for four. So here's the issue. They, I, I learned this term as I started to get into this, this database thing, sharding. And I hope I say that with a proper way, because I'm, I'm from Cuba, and sometimes those words don't quite come out. It's okay. Mark will make fun of you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he does when I use that word. Yes? Okay. It's funnier when you say it, though. I think that's because we're from Florida. We had that other little thing with the yeah. voting thing going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I don't want to go no. there. So how can we avoid that? Okay, that would be my first thing, given that it's hard given that it's expensive. <clears throat> That's where data core is coming in. So here's a little bit more animation, more cartoon, but the cartoon's actually very reflective of what happens in the real world. Rather than having these guys having to wait on each other and experiencing that sluggish behavior, <laughs> what data core is providing is parallel data access on multiple cores for each of these independent requests. That's the centerpiece of what we're talking about. And you can see how quickly, even in this animation, the data is moving through there. So there's two things that are occurring here. One is nobody's having to wait on its neighbors, which is doing something else completely unrelated, nor is it having to go to sleep at all and wait for that context switching until it gets to me. Because we can, we can fulfill these requests as they arrive. Now, down any one of these vertical, the columns, the right ordering and all the things that you would expect to happen in a database will continue to happen. So that kind of sequencing and will, is, is necessary in, in order to maintain ACID properties and the expectations of databases. But between here and here, there's no relationship. So they can proceed irrespective of each other. That's the, the essence of what DataCore is doing in this place. And as a result of that, it's quicker in parallel. So that's the theme here. There is a caution. The caution comes with this because too often when somebody is told, we're going to make things go faster, they think, OK, wow, well, you're going to make everything go faster. I think we're more reserved on that. And we've, we have to appreciate that parallelism doesn't address some problems like, hey, I just coded really badly, and I, what I have is I have a single threaded stream through here, and there's nothing I'm going to do. I'm not going to take that single stream and try to break it up into three threads. No way. That's, that's outside of my domain. I don't have a clue what, what to do with that. And, and this also happens when they try to do uh, 
testing. So sometimes they have a production environment, huge production environments, really getting hammered in the way I described earlier. But when they try to test for this in a test dev environment or in a staging area, their synthetic workloads are in effect single, single threaded as well because they're not able to imitate the real live activity that's coming at them. They simply are not equipped in their labs to do that. So they will look at this problem, they won't experience it, they won't have a clue as well, well how, come, how come the software is not doing its thing? It's because you're not replicating the original problem. It's also, if, if the thing doesn't have any juice, I mean there's just not enough cores there, there's not enough memory, it's starved, you, you can't draw, <laughs> draw from that, there's nothing to pull from. Or if it's a computationally intensive problem. If it's mostly number crunching and there's very little I.O., then that issue is an insignificant part of the overall work stream. So nothing to do for Making it. whatever isn't the bottleneck faster don't help. Yeah, it's, it's misguided. <laughs> so the best fit for Max Parallel for SQL Server is where that sluggish behavior is, is, comes out of many simultaneous users or many processes that are driving that, those requests concurrently. Those are key attributes of what constitutes a best fit. So I know earlier you went through and talked through kind of there's use cases. The, one of the challenges from an operational perspective is when you have a DBA application team, a operations team, there's a big disconnect on what exactly are the target workloads that are experiencing this problem. So how do we help identify as operation, most of us in this room are operations focused people who don't necessarily have the insight into the database. How do we detect that that's a problem in a particular uh, set, data set or okay. data? So there are some hints that the system reports on. SQL, for example, you can look at top talkers. Top talkers, top chatters, whatever you want to call them. They're the ones that are really busy doing work. That's an indication. There are wait states that are revealed that say suggest the problem lies in this area. What I will say is at this point, that smoking gun is elusive. It's very, very difficult to pinpoint exactly when you're experiencing this. We are working with a number of the performance monitoring companies that are experts in this field of trying to trace and analyze and, and look under the covers to see what's going on. So folks like Century One, SolarWinds, Idera, Quest, Virtual Instruments, all have tools that are kind of providing some insights into what's going on, not only at the database level, but system-wide. And we're trying to do is correlate that and say, okay, as we drive more loads, where we know this is happening and where we get relief from Max Parallel, here's what you should look for. And that'll be a, a very important part yeah, of what, ul what ultimately you guys need to come up with something that, you know, PowerShell scripts and perfmon counters that say, you know, there's at least a 60% probability that this is what you're, you know. Exactly, yeah. Because I'm a poster child or I'm not, right? You know, you want to flag that early on. Yeah, That's and, you know, and you don't want people to have to spend $100,000 on monitoring tools before they spend $10,000 on your product. Right. But what's interesting is what, to a person that I've spoken to about this, is they, they'd prefer not to have to learn a different tool. So where we're trying to do is basically feed those tools that they're familiar with and comfortable. And some come natively with SQL Server. So SQL Server has a strong profiler, and, and Windows has obviously some very strong <coughs> performance reporting. So we, we're going to tap on that first before we go okay. try to go somewhere else. Here's a, the other thing that happens, is that if you look commercially at the problem, not technically, but commercially, there's some, some apprehension in some of these companies who are driving these, that they feel they don't, um, they're either for, for example, the line of business application is certified on a particular configuration, they're not able, it's a lockdown system from their perspective, of changing out some of the parameters. So they are not in a situation where they can go make special modifications. They need something that they can basically drop in to pull off and fix their, their issues. So that's gonna be a good, good candidate. <coughs> it's also where they are simply unable to change the hardware or unwilling to do so. Those are gonna be good, good fits. 
Now, I want to give you some customer outcomes. And they're really brief, but just to get the essence of it, well, what I think you'll find is that there's different ways that we exploit what we just pulled off here economically or operationally or from a, a revenue standpoint for the company. One of the, the folks that was working with us on this, uh, Mike Prince at Ultima Business Solution, what they did is they looked at it from, okay, you're telling me I've got all these cores that are being wasted, so how much waste is occurring and why can't I just dial down the number of cores when you're running, when Max Parallel is in the system? You, you told me there was like three wasted in that picture, so I ought to be able to pull three, three out of here and achieve the same result, maybe. You know, you kind of look at it through that. Anyhow, what they did is they ran a sequence that represents their customer base, their, their representative workload, and they found that systems that in the past where they had to provision 20 CPUs, so 20 cores for that job to drive a level of transaction activity, once they introduced Max Parallel, they were able to back off from those VMs and back it down to eight cores and achieve an excess of that transaction at the same or better response rate. Quite stunning. Quite stunning because that translates directly into money spent. If you look at it from a cloud metering and you're on a pay-as-you-go instance, that's going to save you every month. Lots of dough. Okay. It also clearly, the, the moment you start getting into smaller configurations here, you're also saving on licensing cost. Now, you know, one would say, well, of course, then does that mean the, the guys at, at SQL Server are going to be, you know, concerned about this because you're driving down the, the, the revenue stream from there? Well, guess what? It, what it, this does is it makes SQL Server that much more competitive of everything else that's going on there. And so this is all about how do you provide the best experience for the customer with your tool. Here's a different spotlight. And we have been, interestingly enough, uh, working with a number of what I would say online distribution and drop shipping companies. Tire World is one such. And what they do is they are Think of them as a little bit kind of in that Amazon model where clearly um, Tire World doesn't own all the stock. They have a number of wholesalers who have all these tires, Pirelli, Michelin's, you know, whatever you call them, Bridgestone, everything else in the, under the map. And what they're selling to are retailers. So it's a B2B transaction that they're working on. Their business model is based on having these retailers choose them to buy the, the tires from them rather than some other distributors. So to the degree that they can offer the best price and provide the quickest response on request, they're going to be most competitive. That's the, that's the essence of goals for them. They do this drop shipping Especially uh, if you look from the, the European market, there's some seasonality to their, their streams. It has to do with the April time frame when they go into their summer tire months, and then the October when they're asked to be putting in kind of the snow tires and get ready for the slick weather. So those tend to be really peak periods. When they ran with Datacore Max Parallel in here, they were able to reduce the time it took to assess their stock levels by 30%, and their inventory export time, that's how each of them communicate with each other and say, here's what my state is, and I've got these, I have excess stock, and these other ones, I'm really short, so those, those you ought to charge a premium for by 75%. That for them, it's about being competitive. It's not about cost shavings. This is on a machine. This is a, a big mama. <laughs> this is a big Huawei machine. It has half a terabyte of memory on it, 64 cores, all loaded up with SSDs. And Data Core, just by adding that software, did that kind, had that kind of effect on their customer experience. That's a big deal. I'm going to walk you now through a little bit of a, an example so you can see how, this, how you step into this and how you observe the behavior as data course is introduced into the picture. So 
fundamental question. The sequel, SQL is starting to get a lot into this. Why do this versus just going to an in-memory database to solve the same problem? problem? Uh, two reasons. One is many of these line of business applications have to be rewritten in order to go to in-memory. There is going to be a long, long time before that happens. The installed base of SQL Server, in excess of 50% of it, is sitting on 2008 or 2012 SQL Server. It's not moving from there anytime soon. So there is, there is an expense. That, so if you were to ask me what would they do in place of that exactly, said differently, yeah, they could start to re-architect for in-memory. And by the way, when they get there, it's, it's risky. They don't know at the end of the day how much of that in-memory activity will still be postponed at the point where they have to either ingest data or spew it out. So it buys you conceptually quite a bit, but I think this, this caching example I'll bring up here will also kind of shed some light on why that isn't necessarily the solution in many of these cases. So in this order entry example, what we have is the number of users on the left, the transactions per minute, this is a really important parameter when anybody who's looking at the OLTP world, and the average response in milliseconds. This is for the entire transaction. This is not for one I.O. This is for the complete set of like a retail order being placed and going through all its gyrations. This next entry here is the CPU utilization and the total work generated out of this system. So this customer, what they're trying to do is basically they're saying, I'm sitting here and roughly this machine is good for about 40 users. I'm running about 10 seconds. Good. Anytime I see a peak in demand and I tr start to drive up into the 50 users, things get really slow. The response time climbs radically up to a, three times that. Simply unacceptable. Notice that when they do that, there's no more work generated. So those 50 users oh, no, all you hit the disk bottleneck. Have not, actually. Have not hit a, a disk bottleneck. Well, you hit a bottleneck between the database server and the disk. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in between there, yes. There's been somebody's getting in the way. So the first thought is, oh, let's be more aggressive, kind of like that in-memory thing. Let's throw some more cache at it. Let's <coughs> bulk up on memory. Why not? OK. That helped. That did help. So now we went from that 40, we, we passed that wall we had run into, doing pretty good on response time. It went at 50 users. I was able to get it. They were able to get it down about 60 users, good 200 millisecond, right at where that they felt good about it. They did get more work being generated out of the system, and that was good. Now when they start dialing it up a little more, and they try to get to 100 users, boom, again. That's all they can, they can get out of the system. Here's where data core enters the picture. So at this juncture, data core is inserted. We go right past the 100 users. Look at the response time there. So we're at sub 200 milliseconds. Look at the CPU processing. Remember that diagram I showed you? If not, Robert will probably put it up again later. We're putting all those horses to work. And that's exactly, they're processing I.O. That's what they're doing. Because despite all our you know, usual casual understanding about it, a lot of work is required to handle each of those I.O. requests. And it, they consume CPUs. And so that's what you're seeing there. What you're seeing is an increase, pretty, almost three times as many users as they started with by including data core, max parallel for SQL Server in the mix. Now we hit, at this point here, at 150, we're at 95% CPU utilization. We can go one step further, and we did. Said, okay, well, what happens, you know? Can we put another 50 in here? No, at that point, we have exhausted this machine. There's nothing to, it's drained. <laughs> All of its possible potential has been put to use. And that's exactly the situation you want to be in, in terms of knowing that the software is capable of doing that, then you can choose to, to set at which level you want to operate at. Does that, does that help you visualize what's happening on the, no, on the back end? No, you're, you're just talking about results, and we don't, still don't know what you do. So it's... Okay. So what's the tech it, behind it? it the tech behind it. it, it the, 
that how much it helps will be much more informative once we know okay. what it does. All right. Right. You're going. You know, you can go faster, and you haven't told us whether it's a car or a train yet. Okay. We will do that then very shortly. I want. I do want to say that here's another example where the this. A, a lot of expectations have been set with progressive versions of SQL Server. Each one is <coughs> getting better and better and better. These guys at Desk Software, which are the Platinum Sage supplier, they, didn't, they went into this very skeptical. They were saying, you know, this stuff is already, it's really, really optimized. I don't expect you to do that because I keep hearing how, how much of this parallelism is already built into SQL Server 2016. By putting data core in that picture, it was 30% higher productivity from that same environment. So on, on, from a range of expectations that we're setting for any of you who are out there, we're looking at it mostly in this ballparks. From a quicker response time, roughly in the 1.2 to 3x times faster, the transactional rates going anywhere from the 20 to 60% you can expect from this, given that your characteristics are what we discussed as a best fit and that your reports will obviously improve if they so suit the environment. I want to give you just a quick touch on the pricing, because pricing obviously factors into the decision very heavily. If this is costing me a boatload of money, there's no sense doing all this. I'll spend it on some other gadget. It is priced based on 15%, about 15% of the retail recommended price for SQL Server for the corresponding edition. And that's how it's sold. We do offer it for all the different versions, 2012, 20, 2008, 2014, 2016, and 2017 is coming soon, just, just around the corner. <clears throat> In terms of, for anybody who's out there is trying to figure out, well, does this apply to me? What can I do? We do have a number of ways that you can test it. You can download trials, 30-day trials from the Data Core website. We have trials right from the Azure Marketplace, and the also uh, test drives for, for it. And this is what you'll see. If you go on the Azure Marketplace, you'll see this display. You'll see the different versions. You'll see the opportunity to select the type of test drive. Test drive is an interactive experience where database is already built in, but you can obviously do the trials themselves and bring your own data to it. So with that, I think we're in good shape for a, a demonstration to give you some visualization what's going on and then we'll get into the how it is that we do this. So I understand your, your uh, interest and appetite in getting to the second half. So Tim, if you would join us for that, that concludes the first part of our presentation. Thank you. <laughs>